Welcome. 2015 has been officially proclaimed the International Year of Light and Light-Based Technologies by the General Assembly of the United Nations. Should this fact have escaped your attention, you may have seen the light when you received the announcement for Physica 2015 for this meeting. Uh, the International Year uh, sorry, the, the, the international start of uh, event of the year uh, was held at the UNESCO headquarters in Paris um, on 19 and 20 January uh, this year, of course. And in the Netherlands, we started even a few, uh, a few days earlier with a very lively and interesting symposium at the Science Center Nemo in Amsterdam. Although the Year of Light is an initiative of the international physics community, <clears throat> it clearly opens the perspective of bridging to many other communities. The opening event in Nemo clearly reflected this broad cultural appeal of light with contributions by Hans Klevers, president of the KNAW, on the use of light in diagnostics and imaging inside cells by the architect, Ben van Berkel, who is best known for his design of the bridge in Amsterdam, uh, nicknamed the Swan. And he spoke about the use of light in architecture. Uh, by Robert Dijkgraaf on the roles of light in physics and by Ginny Vos, an artist making wonderful light sculptures and many others. We are fortunate to have a strong team led by Kobus Kuipers of the Vom Institute Amolf to organize and coordinate all International Year of Light activities. We are also proud that Rogier van der Heide has accepted the role as ambassador for the International Year of Light uh, in the Netherlands. There are many uh, events, there is a, a, a great program. Uh, uh, you are invited to visit the website that was created, uh, International Year of Light, IYL2015.nl and you can see the entire program for the year. There will be um, a large um, uh, documentary uh, called Einstein's Light, which will, see, uh, uh, which will be uh, shown first in uh, the fall of this year. There is a, a fantastic Scholen experiment which will take place. Please visit the website and see all um, uh, activities and join us to make this a memorable year. Um, on another account, today is also an eventful day for the scientific community and <coughs> physics specifically. Uh, the Minister of Education and Science and the Board of NWO have announced a restructuring of the organization, excuse me, a restructuring of the organization of NWO. This will likely result in the end of the FOM uh, organization as we know it. FOM has been of tremendous importance to the success of physics research in the Netherlands. And needless to say, we are concerned about the reorganization. And today we will be informed about the contours of the no new NWO organization and the position of uh, FOM and the FOM institutes. When this information reaches uh, uh, us, we will share it with you today. But we have confidence in the flexibility of the physics community um, uh, to make this into an opportunity and strengthening our position. But first, we are going to enjoy a wonderful program. Uh, this has been put together by the local organization committee with great support from Noortje de Graaf and her team. The organization of uh, Physica 2015 is chaired uh, by Gerrit Kroesen, Dean of the Faculty. 
Unfortunately, Gerrit Kroesen uh, met with serious health problems this year. And we are very grateful that Henk Swachten has done a wonderful job in stepping in to take over. We wish uh, Gerrit Kroesen all the best in his further recovery. The, Physica, the yearly Physica event is a great opportunity for meeting, learning and discussing. Then we are ready to start the program. And I would like to ask uh, Henk Swachten to come forward and take his role as chair of today and take over the microphone. I wish you all a very joyful and inspiring Physica 2015. On behalf of the Eindhoven University of Technology, welcome all of you to this annual uh, Physica meeting. I think it's the biggest event in physics that is meant for a very broad audience of people with a strong link to physics. Students, teachers, professors, engineers, managers, and so on. It's already mentioned by Jan, it is organized by the Bureau of the Dutch Physical Society, Noortje de Graaf, Marieke de Boer, Escher Brunner, Saskia de Haan, Deborah van Gala Last and Anja Al. And also by a local university team, which will be shown here, headed by Professor Gerrit Kroes, and I'm his stand-in for today. My name is Henk Swachte. All these people together compiled a chock-full program for you. There's a lot of exciting and inspiring physics, fundamentals of gravity, the Nobel Prize on LEDs, physics of life, energy, light, big machines, small scales, education, career, and in between there will be young scientists and students battling for the most fantastic presentation. And last but not least, in the evening there is a spectacular program on sound and light with science, art, and music, and a unique new music play between the university organ and the amazing rattling sound of a gigantic Tesla coil. By the way, the evening program is free of charge, so you can still tweet or WhatsApp your family or friends to invite them to join this fantastic evening program. But that is for later, ladies and gentlemen. I'm now very proud to announce Professor Erik Verlinde as the first speaker of this Physica event. Erik Verlinde started his career in Utrecht with Bernard de Witt and Gerard het Hoofd. And having positions for many years at the University of Utrecht, CERN, and Princeton University, he is now at the University of Amsterdam. Just a couple of years, he was awarded the uh, Spinoza Prize for a number of achievements in the field of theoretical physics. He became famous with his Verlinde formula. He took part on the formulation of the witte dijkgraaf verlinde verlinde equations. He developed the Carle verlinde formula. And recently, he is in a spotlight with his theory to explain gravity. At the FOM meeting in Veldhoven this January, I could not enter the overloaded colloquium room where Eric was giving his gravity talk. Today I'm very pleased to see that we also have a full house here at Physica. So all participants here in the Blaue Zaal and those watching the live stream in one of the colloquium rooms in this auditorium, I will no longer keep you from waiting. Here is our first speaker of Physica, Professor Erik van Linde. Let's welcome our speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for this introduction. And I'm, I'm indeed pleased to be here and to tell you about really an exciting development that's going on now in theoretical physics. It's uh, this year, also 100 years ago, that Einstein wrote down his general relativity theory of gravity. And indeed, it's time to get to a new theory. And not just me, but many of my colleagues and, uh, in the Netherlands, but also international, are working on this new theory, which I think in a few years will have indeed a completely new understanding of gravity. Why do we need it? Um, clearly, uh, there are some things we don't fully understand. Normally, we think about space-time as a stage on which things are moving, and we have matter, and we have forces, and it's this separation between matter forces and space-time that sort of dominates our theories of physics. 
that picture is going to change. We're going to think more differently about space and time and also about matter and gravity. And what I'd like to explain today is that it also gives us insight of what the phenomena are that we are associating with dark matter. So the universe is clearly full of things that we don't understand because we see only a very small percentage of what's actually going on. From the cosmic microwave background, we can deduce that the energy content of the universe consists mostly of dark energy, dark matter, and then a little bit of ordinary matter, and the stuff we see is less than 1%. So clearly, there's a lot of the universe we don't understand. This is deduced indirectly from observations of the CMB. Direct observations of dark matter involve gravitational lensing, where we see evidence for extra matter that, in order to explain the, these lensing effects, we have to assume that there must be much more matter than we see actually in, in this uh, cluster of galaxies. Uh, there's other lensing, it's called weak lensing, where you see uh, with colors code, the red stuff is what we understand as ordinary matter. There we see uh, Röntgen or X-ray uh, radiation. And in the blue, that's determined by weak lensing. We know that there must be matter, but we don't see any evidence for it. The only thing we see is the gravity. So what is going on here? Um, normally we think about this as a particle, but I would like to argue that this is a, a, an indication we don't understand fully what gravity is at cosmological scales. And the most direct observations, which are indeed give you some quantitative uh, way of thinking about this, are the rotation curves of galaxies. So if you look at uh, a galaxy just like the solar system, the, st the stars are going around the middle, most of the matter is in the center, that means that you expect from Newton's law that the velocity would go like this, based on the matter that we see. But what is observed is that the velocities grow much, are much larger and therefore, basically, the, the stars would not stay together unless there's more gravity. So this has to be explained for, by dark matter, some additional matter that we have to add to this galaxy. If we want to keep at least Einstein's theory or uh, Newton's theory still uh, working. This is another way of representing it. So what we see is uh, the observed velocity. This is what we measure in terms of the, what we call the baryonic matter. And then the dark matter must explain a component which we don't, uh, well, see in terms of light, but which gravitationally must be there in order to explain this larger velocity. So this is what you expect on what we observe, and this is what we, sorry, of, of the matter that we observe, and this is the velocities that we do observe. Now, there's a, a, a very funny fact, namely that there is some relations that describe all galaxies. Namely, for instance, the acceleration that determines where this separation occurs seems to be the same for every galaxy. And it has a, a value that's quite intriguing. This was observed by Milgram, who uh, proposed even a modification of Newtonian dynamics, basically just as a way of parameterizing the data. The data seem to indicate, namely, a linear relationship between the, the, the fourth power of the velocity and the amount of baryonic matter inside uh, the a radius r. This is called the, the Tully-Fisher relation. And Milgram said, therefore, well, we have to have a new law of gravity where the acceleration, which is v squared over r, is not just g m b over r squared, that would be Newton's law, but we square the left-hand side and we put an extra acceleration on the right in order to make it also dimensionally correct. And that acceleration has the, 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 the value very close to something that has to do with cosmology. Namely, if you take the Hubble constant that we observe today and multiply it with the speed of light, you get an acceleration. And then for some reason there must be a factor of six there because that fits the data. But this acceleration, while this is indeed true, uh, modified Newtonian dynamics has no theoretical basis, but it's a way of fitting the data. It's like a formula that works phenomenologically. So what I'm going to do actually is I'm going to indeed get to this, uh, try to explain these, uh, these facts uh, from a new way of thinking about gravity. Because there's also uh, theoretical reasons why we think gravity is different than just uh, what uh, Einstein taught us. And this new insight comes from black holes and from string theory. But let me start with black holes. So black holes is where the matter is so dense that uh, the, basically it has collapsed to a point and l light cannot escape. And there's a horizon, a, a, a sphere, a sort of, 
imaginary sphere with a certain radius, which you call the Schwarzschild radius, and light cannot escape from there. Now, if you think about this uh, theoretically, we find all kinds of uh, interesting thought experiments we can do around this. For instance, we can think about uh, dropping boxes with entropy into the black hole and then wonder how the laws of thermodynamics will uh, remain. Well, if you drop a box gradually, very slowly, first of all, you feel a force. It's just a uh, Newtonian force, actually. If you measure the force at infinity, it defines a what we call surface acceleration, which is just given by Newton's formula. And uh, this turns out to be a very important parameter for what sort of characterizes the black hole. But what people discovered by saving the laws of thermodynamics, we have to associate an a, a entropy also to black holes and even a temperature. So this was uh, indeed Meckenstein and Hawking who performed these uh, thought experiments and they derived conclusions from them. Namely, that a black hole must have an entropy proportional to the area of its horizon measured in Planckian units. And that there's also temperature. In a very universal formula, it's given by uh, basically the, the acceleration, and then it's multiplied by the, the well, constants of nature, like h bar, Boltzmann's constant, and the speed of light. So these are beautiful formulas where every constant of nature sort of appears, and it's our very fundamental things that we are learning about it. And it turns out, indeed, that the equations that control uh, black holes look like thermodynamics which already is an indication that th certain things sort of maybe could be derived microscopically. Let me actually tell you a little bit of a thought experiment that, uh, sort of a further thought experiment that uh, happened. Indeed, there's black, uh, the laws of thermodynamics tells us that when we change this, the location of this box a bit by, for instance, dropping it into the black hole, we apply a certain amount of work, namely F delta X, where delta X is the size of the box. And then the law of thermodynamics says that this must be equal to the temperature times the change in entropy. Now, the fact that the temperature is proportional to the acceleration and the force is proportional to the acceleration allows you, when you put it in here, to cancel the, the G, factor G, and have a universal equation for the change in entropy, purely in terms of the mass and the size of this system. This seems to be a, a universal bound on uh, the entropy of a system with a certain amount of mass and a certain size. This is a hint to what the microscopic theory should look like. And it's a very simple calculation, and actually it's a hint indeed about the entropic nature of gravity. So I wrote a paper about five years ago about uh, interpreting gravity as an entropic force, which clearly is a way that this, these experiments are telling us. An entropic force is a force that's only there because of changes of entropy. And a, a well-known example is when you have polymers which can be short when they have a lot of entropy, but when you stretch them, they have less entropy because they have fewer configurations. And this causes the elasticity of rubber. And indeed, uh, it, it has precisely this uh, form where if you turn on a temperature and you calculate the change in entropy, in, in entropy by, by displacing the particle, for instance, then you calculate a force and that's an entropic force. Now, I'm not going to uh, go through the full steps that I uh, had there to derive then gravity, but there is a very simple set of equations. They fit on one page, and eventually, if you put them all together with very familiar formulas like e because mc squared and so on, and eventually, by putting them together, by just assuming that there's an entropy proportional to the, the size of this sphere, you get Newton's law of gravity. So this is the paper that sort of... Uh, made the name entropic gravity. And, but in the meantime, a lot has more has happened. And in this short talk that I'm giving, I would like to indeed tell you a little bit more about what happened since uh, this paper. And this has to do with string theory. Uh, certainly, many people now are working on this topic of trying to derive gravity from entropy. And we have a better understanding even of what is the entropy in there. Indeed, string theory has a number of successes. It has combined gravity and quantum mechanics together and in a certain way even explains gravity. It explains also the entropy of black holes because this formula that Hawking and Bekenstein derived was not really uh, derived from a microscopic system because thermodynamics generally, you know, you have to understand the microscopics in order to calculate really what the entropy is. It's a number of possibilities, uh, microscopic possibilities. So what are these microscopic possibilities? Now, string theory gives an answer. 
So this is a, a success of string theory, but I must say that cosmology is still so far not very successfully uh, described in, in string theory. And there are various reasons for that, and some of which I will mention as I go along. So these are some pictures of what strings look like. They're closed strings and they're also open strings, and they are objects that we call D-brains, where the open strings can be attached to, and the closed strings, they carry gravity, and there are some dualities between them that play an important role. Actually, string theory is quite a complicated mathematically theory. So what, one reason why I think these uh, considerations about entropy are so nice is that eventually are not so much about the math, they're more about the principles behind what's going on here. This is, for instance, is a picture of, a, of a, one of the compactification manifolds, very complicated, but I don't need that if I just talk about entropy because I'm just counting probabilities and possibilities. Uh, another uh, ingredient in string theory, which is quite an uh, important uh, aspect uh, of understanding the, the way that gravity emerges in string theory, is called the ADS-CFT correspondence. It's a du duality, or actually an equivalence, to a gravitational theory in a curved space, and actually it's an anti de Sitter space, which means it has negative um, cosmological constant, it has no dark energy therefore, actually negative dark energy if you would call it that way. But you can describe this in terms of a dual description, which is a theory that lives only on the boundary, and it sort of suggests indeed there's a relationship between the area and what's going on inside, it's called the holographic principle, and it's been realized in here. And we indeed understand why gravity sort of emerges in, in this extra dimension. We can put black holes there and do all kinds of calculations very explicitly. And it's in this context that people have indeed further understood the relationship between entropy and what now is called the emergence of gravity. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more about string theory and I'm going to do it just sketchy because I mean I cannot give a full course here. And I'm going to give you some hints of what uh, well, we need also to go to the cosmological situation. Namely, string theory could indeed describe eventually what's happening in black holes, and it does it in a way by introducing more, um, well, more than just particles. It has strings, it has these D-brains, there are many things that are uh, vibrating in string theory, and so therefore much more is happening than what we normally have in a particle theory. And this allows us to describe uh, what, what black holes are. But Black holes don't occur in the vacuum, because you need to put a lot of matter together to get a black hole. And there's indeed, first of all, a vacuum phase, I would call it. It's just like you have different phases of, of uh, the uh, matter. You can have actually different phases of what I would call space-time. If you take the vacuum phase, then particles are localized. There can be strings uh, that stretch between them, but they are not there. And they will, but virtually, they can be there. And they give rise, actually, to uh, the gravitational forces between them. So maybe I should even show this here. There's one way we understand gravity between objects, is indeed by integrating out open strings, and that's basically telling you that's a virtual process. So these virtual strings give rise to um, gravity, for instance. Well, there are many uh, different vacua in string theory, but it's a, a ground state, it's zero temperature, but generally, it does not have positive dark energy. It's usually this anti de Sitter space with the negative uh, dark energy. So dark energy will have to be something else. Also, if we want to describe black holes, we have a different phase of string theory, which I will call the entropic phase. It's here where all these open strings get excited, they will carry entropy, and they will contribute to the possibilities which are there. And if you count all those possibilities, you did indeed find the correct entropy to explain black holes. So this is a different system than the one I had here. This is sort of the vacuum. This is an excited state. It has a temperature, it has an entropy, and indeed it's describing black holes and maybe other things. And we understand this quite well. We have a way of indeed describing the thermodynamics through statistical physics. It's a microscopic description of what's going on. Now, uh, in the recent discussions about how we're going to understand gravity, the following quantity plays an important role. It's an, an, uh, an ingredient of what we call quantum information theory. Even if you have the vacuum, so there's nothing happening, you can ask the following question. If I look at the state, the quantum state of the vacuum, I can separate this into 
two parts, one which is the internal part of some region and another part which is the outside. That means I can separate the quantum state as a product of states inside and outside. And generally those states are entangled. That means they cannot just be written as a product, but they have some sum where you connect observables inside and outside. And then you can calculate a quantity which is called the entanglement entropy. Namely, you take this state, you trace over the Hilbert space, say, or associated to the outside, and that gives you a density matrix for the inside. And then the entropy, as von Neumann def defined it, is given by this formula, and that's called the entanglement entropy. It tells you how much the states inside and outside are entangled. Now, there are different ways, different forms of entanglement entropy, and even if in the vacuum, as I said, there is a entanglement. And that turns out to be proportional to the area of the surface that's separating the inside and the outside. So this has nothing to do with black holes, but it turns out that it's just the vacuum that already carries this entropy. And then it's called entanglement entropy. But if it's an excited state, that means it has a finite energy, then generally you expect that there's not just an area law, but there's also a volume law. That means that things will grow like the volume if I make this system bit bigger, because there's indeed a finite number of states. Now, entanglement entropy plays an important role uh, as a way of measuring, for instance, the difference between those two phases. I had the vacuum phase and I had the entropic phase, and entanglement entropy is one way of uh, distinguishing between them. So it's an order parameter. But it also tells you something about the first law, because it, indeed this entropy satisfies a, a, a law of thermodynamics, uh, namely if I change the energy inside, there is this law that we all know about. And actually, this law can be now used, and that actually has been done, to derive, again, what gravity is. So string theory uh, in the vacuum phase indeed has area entanglement. So if I take some region in here, uh, the entropy between inside and outside actually scales like the area, and precisely in the same form that I wrote down for black holes. Here, actually, I put some constants uh, to one to make the formula a little simpler. And actually, this has been computed microscopically in this anti de Sitter situation. So the anti de Sitter space we know actually is a vacuum state. And it actually, usually we don't know it for all services, but it's something that is now being sort of worked out as I speak. But so I let me assume that this is a vacuum. And now I want to have some other consequences. If I change the vacuum by adding matter, I do change the entanglement entropy. Actually, it's the same formula that I wrote down before. Uh, namely, it's proportional to the mass that I put there and the size of the system. And somehow, if I change the entanglement entropy, uh, this has to be compensated. Because entanglement entropy cannot just change like that. It's something what we call an adiabatic invariant. And that actually gives rise to this, uh, sorry, the first law that I wrote down. And actually, people have now indeed shown that when we put matter there, the area has to adjust itself so that the, ent the entropy stays the same. And this actually is the back reaction of space to the presence of matter. And if you write down the equations, you get actually from the second law, or the first law I should actually say, uh, you get Einstein gravity. And this is a hot topic now. People are deriving Einstein's equation just again from entropy and relations of thermodynamics, but the entropy they talk about is entanglement entropy. Also the fact that we have Gauss's law, the fact that we can measure the mass by putting a sphere around it, by just integrating the gradient of Newton's potential, that's a thing we know in electrodynamics, but also true in, in gravity, actually makes use of this property that the entanglement is only like the area and that we're in the vacuum. This actually is the thing that's going to change when we look at a more general situation. Because I want to go to the sitter space with positive uh, energy and with positive cosmological constants, and therefore there will be dark energy in there. And the new thing about the sitter space is that it has a horizon. It also has an entropy, therefore, because I can write down an entropy which is the size of the horizon. And this horizon is huge. It's the size of the universe. It's basically determined by the Hubble constant. So one over the Hubble constant that gives us a, a radius and that gives the size of the horizon and actually gives an enormous amount of entropy. It's 10 to the 120. And that's uh, the information that we need to describe what may be going on inside. It also has a temperature, but that temperature is, a f is very low because it's determined by the Hubble constant. This temperature, I don't even know what it is, but I will be writing many zeros if I write this in ordinary units. 
It's h bar times the Hubble constant over 2 pi. But together, because there's a lot of entropy, they represent a lot of degrees of freedom, and they are associated with empty the sitter space. Well, empty, there's dark energy in there. So this is the entropy carried by dark energy. And this is what we have to add to the sitter, empty the sitter space to get a physical situation. And as I sort of indicated also with these colors, actually, this is not just a ground state. It's an excited state. It has a temperature. It has all kinds of things going on. And now if we start deriving gravity, we get different equations. So the basic idea is indeed to think about this entropy that's in the sitter space, but associated with the dark energy inside. That means there's an entropy density, and it's a volume law. So it's not the area law, but we have really something in space, and that's the cosmo at cosmological distances we can see this, and this is the energy which we call dark energy, but it also has an entropy. And suddenly, the laws of gravity will change if I take this into account, not at short distances, but at long distances. So if I indeed put now matter inside, it changes again the entanglement entropy and there must be a back reaction. But the back reaction is not just like what we have in empty states, the vacuum. We have to also take into account the, the, the entropy that's in the volume. And Gauss's law still applies at short distances because indeed there's still an area law. But at large distances, when I get sort of in the region where things are being thermalized and I get an, a volume entropy, Gauss's law no longer holds. And you can calculate what's going on. So there's a certain transition when we go from inside to outside because volume goes faster than area. So area is dominant in large, short distances. The volumes become important at large distances. And suddenly the nature of gravity changes. If you have an entropy density, then actually gravity becomes more like elasticity because if you then change the shape of space, you actually change indeed the dynamics, and there's a sort of an elastic component to what gravity is because of the energy and the entropy density that I have out there. This you can quantify. Because there's a beautiful analogy, actually I didn't bring it with me, but there's this material which I, is silly putty. It's indeed polymers, uh, and they are sort of put together, and they have elastic properties. And they're purely thermodynamic origin. And what happens is that if you bounce it, it bounces, but if you put it on the table and wait, it flows. And the reason is that these, these polymers can move on long time scales, but not on short time scales, they cannot. So there's a different behavior at short distance and at long, dis long times, and also short distance and long distance. And you can even make a formula, and actually the formula appears in this literature, that tells you what goes on if, well, that's actually one of the things that happens here, is that these polymers, they can leave the material and they uh, leave behind some uh, memory effects which are sort of an extra elastic component which has been calculated and it produces a formula in a paper and I'm going to use the same formula now for gravity and this is where I will connect to these observations. So this is the formula I'm going to get actually. It's, so here's the integral of uh, the elastic energy and it gives you something proportional to the temperature and some number of degrees of freedom. I'm going to do the same here. So this is the gravitational energy. So grad phi is just uh, the, the acceleration. How do, am I doing with time, by the way? I'm, I'm doing with time? Two minutes. Two minutes. I'm almost there. Well, or, or, or you missed the exciting part, but fine. <laughs> so um, what I'm going to do is actually I'm going to take this formula and compare it to data. So actually, one way, another way of rewriting it is uh, the same formula as this way. And here are the data. It reproduces the mont phenomenology. If I take this formula and I differentiate with respect to R, assuming that the mass is mostly centered, I get exactly the relation that Milgram wrote down. So I reproduce all of these, the mont phenomenology. So all of these graphs that Milgram actually matched with the data, I can also derive from my equation. But my equation is slightly different, because mont does not work perfectly. Mont has some problems in clusters. This is Bob Sanders from Groningen. And this is uh, the problem he has, and I actually can reproduce this. And now the final thing, uh, this is an, a similar plot. I'm going to tell you what I can do for the universe. I mean, there's some way in which uh, I can rewrite my formula as a relationship between the average baryonic density and dark matter density, 
is this formula, but it predicts something for the, the universe. And these are the measurements that we did, oh sorry, these are the measurements we checked for clusters still, but this is what uh, Kobe and Planck did, sorry, WMAP and Planck did. This is the measurement, and this is the relation that I, I put in. And I, it fits, fits the data perfectly. So I think there's really evidence that this new view of gravity can connect to data. That's the talk. Thank you very much, Professor Verlinde, for this beautiful, inspiring talk. We have actually time for one, maybe two questions. Who would like to kick off? Yes, please. You have to wait for the microphone. <clears throat> Here, over there. Modified Newtonian dynamics has been around for about 30 years and has been applied to many cosmological data, not just the ones that you showed, and is now generally accepted not to be able to fit all the data. So if your theory reproduce MOND, then you're in trouble too. So MOND is a certain way of parameterizing the data on dark galaxy. If you cannot reproduce the data, you cannot have a good theory. So the fact that I have, I have a different equation than Mont, but I can reproduce what's called the Mont phenomenology. That means I can fit the data in situations where Mont applies, but Mont doesn't apply in every situation. My explanation of the relationship, which is microscopic, is not the same as Milgram wrote down. Milgram wrote down a law, a new law of uh, inertia that he modified and should be applying generally. In the situation I'm looking at, I'm looking at what's called a memory effect, which has a very different interpretation. It's something that has to do with situations where there was enough time sort of to build up uh, some equilibrium. But if you, for instance, like in the bullet cluster, you have a dynamic situation, things will change. And there are other situations, actually a formula that I wrote down wasn't even the same, because I can only derive Mont if I make an, an approximation in my equation. And the plots that I had to go through very quickly actually show exactly in situations where MON doesn't work, that my formula does, well, does work. I think there is a question here in front. Yeah, it's allowed. If it's a short question, Theo, please. It's very short because I don't claim to understand all the details, but I was worried that Gauss's law does not work at larger distances or as cosmological uh, distances, as you said. Why is that? Ah. Because what I'm claiming is that the extra matter that we normally associate with dark matter is caused by the matter that we see. So in order to save Gauss's law, we had to assume more matter, which we call dark matter. So you have already assumed that Gauss's law works because you have bought into the argument that it must be extra matter. Okay, I see what you meant. Thanks. Okay, we have to stop the discussion here. Um, Professor Eric Verlinde will be here at the break still to answer all of your questions, he promised. So let's thank the speaker again for the beautiful talk. <laughs>